Hi everyone, welcome to Five Code Shakespeare Hamlet character analysis. In this series, we look at a total of nine different characters and today we're gonna look at Polonius. What I do in each video is first identify important character traits of each character, and then we dig into the text to find several quotes to analyze that prove the claim. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and you can instantly download a copy of the PDFs I use in this series by visiting my shop and making a one-time purchase. See the description for details. Polonius is one of Shakespeare's great characters. He's really complex and it's possible to love him and hate him at the same time. I think Oliver Ford Davies in the 20, uh, 2009 version is the best I've seen. This version generally is the best that I've seen, so do have a look at that. Uh, he's hilarious in this version. Uh, he's a narcissist, a Machiavellian. He's both a good and a bad father. He's a terrible hypocrite, as you probably already know. He was a spy master. Historically speaking, he can be read allegorically uh, as, as reflecting the, the political tensions of the age. So we're going to have a quick look at that today, and it sheds some interesting light on the character and the play generally. Most interestingly, I think uh, that he he was he was Hamlet's parallel. Shakespeare did this in almost all his plays. He had he he doubled characters. So in this play, for example, we've got Hamlet and Laertes. They're basically the same people, right? In uh, with different characters in similar situations. Lady Macbeth and Macbeth, the same the same character basically, uh, male and female versions. So Shakespeare did this to 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 shed light on each of the different characters. So we're going to look at that today. They're both annoying. Polonius and Hamlet are both annoying know-it-alls, as you're probably aware. Narcissists, hypocrites, arrogant and domineering, deceptive and cunning, and really, really interesting, they are both comic relief. It's a hilarious play, as you hopefully you've, you've been made aware. This version brings out the comedy in the play really, really well. Again, Oliver Ford Davies does a fantastic job. Okay, so let's start with the first one, narcissism. Polonius' narcissism runs throughout the entire play. I don't think he opens his mouth once without revealing some aspect of his narcissism. So what I'm going to do uh, is briefly introduce the character traits right now. And then as we go throughout the other character traits, I'm going to uh, pause and highlight where we can see the narcissism using these little black boxes. So pay attention to that as we go. So Polonius' narcissism is demonstrated throughout the play. These narcissistic traits can be identified in his speech and his behavior. And I've adapted this from these particular websites. So narcissism can be defined as someone who has too much self-importance, a sense of arrogance, boastfulness, and self-interest. They overestimate their capabilities. That's what he does. They're patronizing. They have an excessive need for admiration. That's probably most dominant with Polonius here. They're very demanding. They expect everybody to do uh, what they want them to do. They have a willingness to exploit and manipulate others. Uh, they're deceptive. Now, that's that's a Machiavellian trait, and that's one of the things I'm going to look at uh, in this video briefly. But mostly, he's he, he's he's a narcissist. Uh, you can look at my Machiavellian video for uh, uh, for a more detailed look at that of uh, concerning Polonius and the other characters in the play. They lack empathy and they belittle other people. Now, when you when you hear that, you're probably thinking of uh, poor Ophelia and how he belittles her both in private and in in public. It's it's really quite uh, it's really quite sad. So here's, I mean, here's just a very, very obvious quote to demonstrate his narcissism. Uh, when he's trying to, when he's talking to the king and the queen, he's trying to prove to them that he did the right thing by separating Hamlet and Ophelia. He says, come on, come on, come on. Hath there been such a time, king, that I have positively said this is the truth when it is proved otherwise? Remove my head from my body if I am wrong, is what he says. So there, there's an example of his boastfulness. He's boasting in front of the king to make himself feel good. He's overestimating his capabilities, of course, because nobody is perfect all the time. And of course, there's, there's this de absolute desire for approval from the king and the queen. So that's how I'm going to do narcissism throughout this, uh, throughout, throughout this video. So do pay attention. All right, the first character trait that I want to pay attention to is that he's actually kind of a good father. As I mentioned, there's a lot we don't like about Polonius, um, and, and we can love and hate him at the same time. His attitude towards and his feelings for his kids are ambiguous at best, and so it, everything I say here is somewhat tentative, but I think we can find some evidence that he was actually a good father, a loving father anyway, maybe not necessarily a good father. So Polonius' feelings for his children are complicated by his own ego and need for control, for sure. That happens. That that's Shakespeare wrote characters true to life, and he recognizes that that this stuff happens. When you're watching a, a drama or a movie or something and it just, it's cringe, for example, 
is the result of something that, that doesn't fit with our experience of human beings. But when we look at Polonius, there's none of that. It's like, yeah, I recognize that kind of character all over the place. So uh, his feelings are complicated. He does love his kids, I believe, but it's, but it's wrapped up and knotted up. His love is knotted up with his own ego, his own need for control, narcissistic need for control. Nevertheless, there is evidence that he loves and is concerned for both Laertes and Ophelia. There's a little bit more evidence that he uh, loves Laertes, less uh, uh, with Ophelia, but we will we'll have a look at that. So regarding Laertes, Polonius grants, the first piece of evidence I would say is that he actually grants Laertes his wish to return to Paris to continue his studies. Now on its own, not so much, you know, your kid wants to go back to go back to university. Why would a parent, why should a parent be proud that the parent let the kid go? It's not that big a deal, right? But it contrasts with Claudius's really, really, and Gertrude's selfish desire for Hamlet to remain in Denmark. He wants uh, 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 Hamlet to remain in Denmark so he can keep an eye on him, right? So keep your, keep your friends close but your enemies closer that's why he wants uh, Hamlet to, to, to stay there so so yeah we, that that can be some evidence so here we see in act one scene two Claudius says have you your father's leave what says Polonius so are, did your father give you permission to go back to school and Polonius says uh, he hath my lord wrung from me my slow leave so I was reluctant to let him go but you know what I did so there you go the father did the right thing by laborsome petition he, he hounded me and hounded me, and at last, upon his will, I sealed my hard, hard consent. So he wanted to go, so I said, I gave him a hard yes. I sealed my hard, my hard consent. I do beseech you, give him leave to go. So he's reluctant to, to let go, but he does the right thing. Now, if you go back and watch my Wasteland video, uh, which I've linked in, in one of these PDF slides, uh, uh, the Wasteland video is about the parent, the tyrant parent who doesn't let the kids grow up. It's like the Dursleys not letting Harry Potter go to uh, go to Hogwarts to become who they are. So yeah, in this regard, he's not the tyrant parent. He does let his kid go off to become uh, independent, do you see? And here's a great uh, a screenshot from the 2009 version. Uh, here we see Polonius in the back. He's really proud of his son, but it's complicated. He's proud of his son as an individual. Look at my boy, he's growing up and he's gonna be independent and maybe exceed me in his, in his, in his, tal in his uh, career, maybe. Or is he proud of him because the son is merely an extension of the self? And I think it's absolutely both. So narcissistically speaking, here's a bit of self-importance and we can see it captured in this uh, in this scene here. The self-importance gets revealed here. I gave him my leave, do you see? So that might be some narcissism too. Okay, so Polonius himself heeds. Now, the next piece of advice comes from the famous, famous speech, uh, goodbye speech to Laertes. Here he is going off to school and here's the, here's the son uh, wanting to love the father, loving the father and wanting to believe the best in his father. And there's the daughter, there's Ophelia here. It's a lovely scene, very funny scene, the way that it's acted here. Here we see kind of the bossy, lovable but bossy father, do you see? So uh, that speech is fantastic. It's one of the greatest in all of Shakespeare. Polonius heeds little of the advice he gives to Laertes. The advice is beautiful and we can read it straight and say, yes, yes, I, that's the kind of advice I as a father want to give to my child. You see, we can read it in that way. But his departing words to his son are some of the most memorable. Yes, so he, he, he does, but he's, he's a hypocrite and he doesn't follow any of, the, on any of the advice that he gives to Laertes. But regardless of that, uh, his departing words to his son are some of the most memorable in Shakespeare. Evidence of uh, Polonius' pomposity, hypocrisy, and need for control are there. Yes, you can't deny that. But I think we can also uh, read the advice as being uh, somewhat heartfelt. And again, here's a, a screenshot when, when Polonius is saying some of his most beautiful lines, which is, to thine own self be true, which is lovely, lovely, lovely. Here's the son really connecting with the father. Now, again, he's such a hypocrite that it makes it hard for us to take it at face value. So here's the quote in, in full. The last piece of advice he, he gives is, this above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as night the day that thou canst not be false to any man. Farewell, my blessings season this in thee. Lovely, lovely. If I could come up with lines like that to give to my kids, wouldn't it be wonderful? However, it's tainted by the fact that he's a hypocrite. So lovely parting words, and it's also tainted by the fact that I don't even think it's true. He is incredibly false to almost everybody as the court spy master. So is he being true to himself? Is he lying here? Okay, so it's, it's complicated. And, and this is a great screenshot. Here's where he's looking back at Ophelia and saying, oh, here we go again with some of, this, uh, some of this advice. But again, it's a tender scene. It's a very tender, lovely scene. 
complicated by the fact that Polonius is a flawed, flawed human being like all of us. Uh, perhaps the most uh, revealing, the most convincing evidence that, uh, uh, that he was a good father, or at least a good-ish father, is how deeply uh, uh, Laertes loved his father. Laertes' love and loyalty to his father is so fierce that he's willing to give his life in this life and the afterlife uh, to avenge his murder. This suggests unconflicted, deep love and respect, which must have been earned by Polonius over time. You see, he's a, he's a, he's a young man in his probably mid-20s to 30s or something like that. And so over time, he still has these feelings. He hasn't become soured on his dad as he grew up into an independent thinker, DC. So that, that's some evidence too, I think. So here he is when he's confronting, uh, in this scene here, he's confronting uh, Claudius because he thinks Claudius killed his father. And he says, to hell allegiance, vows to the blackest devil, conscience and grace to the profoundest pit, I dare damnation. What that means is I don't care what happens to me in the afterlife. Again, in sharp contrast to Hamlet, who says maybe in the afterlife uh, 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 things are going to happen. So he says, I don't care what happens to my soul. I'm going to murder. Uh, I'm going to murder uh, the murderer of my father. To this point, I stand that both the worlds I give to negligence. I don't care this world, the next world. Come, let come what comes. Only I'll be revenged more thoroughly for my father. So love and reverence for the father mirrors Hamlet. Again, I've briefly introduced uh, the idea of the mirroring, the mirroring, the, the parallel characters and the doubling. Okay, so give me my father, says the son. Must love him, must love him, I think. There's less evidence that Polonius does love his, his daughter. Uh, he's much harsher with his daughter, and we'll have a look at that now. Polonius' love and concern for Ophelia is harder to discern. Mostly he bullies and humiliates her. That's what, we're, that's what we remember most about Ophelia is that she is a, a very weak, bullied character. She's no Juliet at all. Okay, if you want strong female characters in Shakespeare, go elsewhere. There's lots of them, uh, but Ophelia is not one of those characters. So, uh, so, so, but in a rare, tender moment, tender and humble mo moment, Polonius does admit his mistake. When Remember he said... Uh, uh, bar Hamlet from you. You shan't see your boyfriend anymore. It's a really cruel and absolute uh, dictate that he that he imposes upon the two young lovers, uh, and that ends up being a mistake because it drives Hamlet mad. Uh, so Polonius admits that in a tender scene when they're alone. Now he ruins this later because when he's in front of the king, he becomes boastful and narcissistic again, and he throws his daughter under the bus. Uh, but we'll get there in just a minute. In a rare and tender, te in a rare, tender and humble moment, Polonius admits his mistake. He expresses regret and reveals his deep, honest concern for Ophelia's well-being. I think it's true. I think it's true. It's tainted, as we've talked about, with the com with uh, the, the weaknesses in Polonius's character. But I think he does he does love her. So here's here's how Polonius trying to, they're they're trying to figure it out because Ophelia just said Hamlet came to me when I was in my closet and he was acting all really 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 weird and Polonius is trying to figure out why he's gone insane and he says what have you given him hard words of late so he begins this short speech uh, by trying to blame. Uh, Ophelia and o Ophelia really really frustrated she says no my good lord I did as you did command I did repel his letters and denied Hamlet's access to me so I just did what you told me uh, and in the 1996 version uh, Kate Winslet uh, uh, acts that a little bit more aggressively uh, in this version she's a, she's a bit more passive and I think the passive acting of it is more accurate to what Shakespeare was looking for. And Polonius says in a lovely moment, this is lovely, if, if you could be this kind of person, ladies and gentlemen, you should try to be that kind of person because it's a lovely uh, admission of a mistake that you made. It's very, very humble and, and, and quite touching. And he says, I am sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. I'm sorry that I hadn't been more attentive to what he was doing and I hadn't been smarter in my analysis. But I feared he was messing with you. I feared he did but trifle and meant to rack thee. Now remember back in those days, a, a woman who had lost her virginity was uh, damaged goods and it was difficult uh, for her to find a place in the world, do you see, let alone just simply a husband. I feared he did but trifle and, and meant to rack thee, but beshrew my jealousy. By heaven, it is as proper to our age. It is proper to old people to cast beyond ourselves and our opinions. See, that's so true. Older people tend to be arrogant narcissistic older people tend to be overconfident in their analysis that's true that's one of the narcissistic traits that we're going to talk about today and he admits it he says yes old people tend to be uh, too stubborn and, and, and firmly confident in our beliefs 
just as it is common for younger people to be idiots, to, be, to lack discretion and be reckless, of course. That's a great picture of, of age versus youth, and it's accurate. It's right on. And then he shakes his head. Here, this is the scene where he's looking at her, and he says, come, we go to the king. Uh, lovely, lovely acting here. This is, this is a, sh a shot when he's actually saying this. And Ophelia looks up and she's surprised because she hasn't heard these tender words from her father very much, do you see? And there's a longing, there's a need for her to, to have the approval of her father, which she does not get very much in this, uh, in this play. So a very tender moment, but it's very fleeting because as soon as he starts to talk to the king, he humiliates her uh, uh, and throws her under the bus to save his own reputation. And we're going to look at that today. Again, lovely wise words. Uh, is this true awareness? I think it is. In this moment, it's true awareness. He is regretful. He does love his daughter, and he did want to protect her because a woman's virginity back in those days was very important, and he does have her, her best interests at heart. But again, uh, uh, he, he blows it in almost the very next scene. All right, so that's Polonius the good father. A little bit of evidence there. You do with it what you will. And here's Polonius the bad father. You could use this stuff to argue the opposite. As you might be aware, parental interference, manipulation, and betrayal are major themes of this play. Um, click these links for more. I, I really go into quite a lot of depth on these particular themes, uh, the, the wasteland theme, betrayal, and the manipulation. All the parents in this play, Claudius, Gertrude, and Polonius, all of them are guilty of creating that emotional wasteland, political wasteland. In these videos, I talk about how there's a emotional, psychological wasteland, there's a social wasteland, and there's a cosmic wasteland, wasteland as well, which is connected to the great chain of being stuff. And all of that comes from these, partly from bad parenting uh, and murder, of course, murder of a king. So an atmosphere of distrust is created by these parents. Uh, uh, the, the tricks in the world. Now, that's a much neglected quote, I think, and I'm going to examine that a little bit more today. Uh, Ophelia is, 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 has been in her craziness, she says there are tricks in the world. She mumbles, and we don't even hear her say it. We hear a gentleman uh, uh, report that to to Gertrude and and uh, and Horatio. And what that reveals to me is that yeah, she goes crazy not just because her father died. Not just that at all. That's not enough. What she really goes crazy uh, uh, over is the fact that she can't handle her. She, she's not cut out for the for the intrigues of the wasteland. She's not cut out for all of the tricks in the world that she hears, and her father is at the center of this. As the world, at the as the court spy master, he's at the center of these tricks in the world, and she 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 can't handle that. So yes, so the parents create this wasteland, the tricks in the world that that Ophelia bemoans before her suicide. Polonius is guilty, perhaps unforgivingly. Now again. I just tried to argue that he was a good father. Yeah, fair enough. I think that's true too. But I think you could make a, a solider case that he was not a, not a good father. He's manipulating and he betrays the trust of both Laertes and Ophelia for his own aggrandizement and out of his own need for control. And this is the scene where he's hiring the spy, Ronaldo, to go spy on his son. So did he love Laertes? Yes. Is he spying on Laertes? Yes. So why? We're going to look at that now. So here he is. Knowledge is power. Remember, he's the court spy master. So he, he, he's, he's looking for a uh, uh, power for its own sake, I'm going to argue. And here's Ronaldo. He does a great job of watching this. And he's like, dude, 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 what, what's up? You want me to spy on your son? So the reaction of Ronaldo is actually quite funny, tragically funny. Okay, so let's explore the bad father regarding Laertes first. Please spread malicious, malicious rumors about my son, says Polonius to the spy Ronaldo. Like Claudius and Gertrude, who hire Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to spy on Hamlet, Polonius hires a spy to follow his son Laertes to Paris to gossip about him to his acquaintances. Now what he's doing here is he's fishing for the sordid details of his son's life. So you go to Paris, find out who his friends are, and drop little rumor bombs about uh, about Laertes, like he likes to gamble, he likes to drink too much, right, 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 in order to fish out sordid details of his friends of his son's life. So the question we ask is, why, father, are you doing this? Implicitly, then, Polonius must distrust Laertes. He must assume that Laertes behaves badly while he's away. And so, but again, why is he so concerned that he feels that spying is necessary? All young men are going to be somewhat misbehaved. They're going to waste time playing video games and things like that. But why is the father so obsessed with knowing these flaws, these character flaws, in very human character flaws, uh, that he sends a spy and he pays him good money to do that? 
Well, uh, I would say that, and again, I'm, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about Polonius as the spy master, as the political spy master uh, of the Elizabethan age. Uh, and in that regard, then simply, if your job is to get all of the information that you can and feed it to the king, then you just love knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Knowledge is power. Knowledge being power, Polonius is seeking advantage over his son. Power for power's sake. Uh, and as I said, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, him, the allegory of the spy master uh, below. Um, why do you seek power? Why do you seek knowledge? You seek it for its own sake and so that you can use it to as leverage over somebody. So how is he going to use this? Once he finds out that his son is behaving somewhat badly, disreputably, what's he going to do when Laertes comes back and they visit? Hi, son, how you doing? I know what you've been up to. What's, what's he going to do with that, do you see? It's, it's an open question because we really, we really don't know. As suggested by his demands of Ophelia, as we're going to talk about below, Polonius wants to ensure that Laertes upholds the family reputation. Now, I think that might be more on point. I think uh, uh, he, he's obsessed with his reputation, as we've said, his narcissism. He wants to know what everybody's doing in his family so that his family is not harming his reputation abroad, do you see? Because he is a, a high-ranking political figure. Everything is about him. So knowledge for its own sake, knowledge to take advantage, to use it as leverage over his son, and knowledge uh, uh, to protect the family reputation. I think that those, those are some reasons why he sends the spy. So here he is talking to the spy, to hired spy re Renal. Although, see you now, your bait of falsehood takes this fish of truth. So when you drop these malicious rumors, that's the bait. And then the friend will say, oh, yeah, he does drink a lot. That's the, that's the, you've hooked the fish. And thus do we of wisdom. Now, here's his narcissism here. He's boastful, overestimating, desire for admiration. He wants everyone to, to, to respect him. That's, that's the, the reputation thing. And he's being very deceptive, of course, because he's hiring a spy. So here he says here, and thus do we, we people of wisdom, us wise people and people who have far reach we have a lot of power that's the boastfulness and overestimation of himself perhaps with windlasses and assays of bias by indirections find directions out by manipulating by going or in by indirectly dropping hints and stuff we find out what the truth is he's proud of himself he's proud of his abilities as a spy master and why not if it's your job why not be proud of it right why not do it well so by my former lecture and advice you shall find out uh, um, what my son has been up to. If you listen to my advice, if you do your job as a spy, that I'm in the way that I'm telling you to do, spy, then we will find out what's going on. So the cunning courtiers modus operandi, that's how they operate. Lies, feints, and deceptions. That's what they do. Okay, so now, how is he a bad father regarding Ophelia? If popular fiction movies teach us anything it's that parents are evil parents create wastelands tyrant dragon parents create wastelands hansel and gretel there's the devouring mother Coraline's other mother that's the devouring mother uh, these stories are all over the place and for good reason too so parent as villain is the most common story involving parents I, because it is a fictionalized account of the struggle we all must undergo separation from our parents uh, as, as children, our parents are gods, and we are, in, we are not separated from them. We are, we are the same. We see ourselves as one. We, don't, we haven't individuated completely yet. Uh, when we reach adolescence, we start to see that they have these flaws. And if the parent is wise, like a Dumbledore, the parent says, please kill me, and you go and do your own self. But if the parent is not wise and selfish and narcissistic, they become the consuming mother in this case, like Hansel and Gretel. Here, stay in my sugar house forever, and I will eat you up. I will use you for my purpose. Purposes. That's the devouring mother, the other mother, Hansel and Gretel Witch, and lots of Disney moms do this. They try to they consume their daughters because they're jealous of them. It's the great mother in the negative aspect, and the great father in the positive aspect is someone like Dumbledore, who, as I've said in other videos, go back and watch my um, Wasteland video. I talk about this a lot. Dumbledore is the good father, and he actually says, you know, please kill me, Harry. please kill me, Snape, so that Harry can become Harry. Do you see? So the master is the master, but then the master has to get out of the way so that the son or the daughter can become the master. And if the parent doesn't get out of the way, they're a tyrant, they're a dragon, they're Voldemort, do you see? Uh, it, it's really, really profound, and that parent as a villain is really real. Go watch The Joker, and you'll see some of that. Uh, here's a beautiful shot from one of the Harry Potter movies. There's poor Malfoy, uh, the white-haired boy. He's, 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 he's trapped in two cages. One, his father uh, is the tyrant dragon that's, that's uh, con uh, consuming his life's energies for himself. And, of course, everybody is uh, caught in Voldemort's bigger cage uh, as the ultimate tyrant. So remember, Malfoy, you are not you, you are me.
that's what the tyrant parent says, uh, demands of the father the cage within the cage. So now we can replace Malfoy here with poor Ophelia. Ophelia is in the cage of her father. Is the father in the cage of the court? Maybe we could think of it in those terms too. Uh, so there's lots of lots of evidence that uh, 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 um, Polonius is that kind of tyrant father regarding Ophelia, not so much as we've seen with, with Laertes, but certainly with his daughter. So here's some evidence here. Uh, in Act 1, Scene 3, after he says a, a beautiful go goodbye to Laertes, he turns uh, uh, viciously on Ophelia and says, um, what's going on between you and Hamlet? Mm. <laughs> Do you see? <laughs> he had the classic, classic uh, 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 evil, evil parent. And Polonius says, You do not understand yourself so clearly as it behooves my daughter and your honor. What's going on between you? Give me up the truth. Vicious. And Ophelia says, He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of affection to me. Affection? Po, pa, you speak like a green, inexperienced girl, unsifted in the perilous circumstances of the world. You're just young and stupid. Do you believe it's these tenders, as you call them? And Ophelia, again, she's no Juliet, no Juliet. She says, sir, I don't know what I should think. Juliet doesn't respond uh, uh, nearly as e equivocally as this or as, as, as meekly as this. Uh, Polonius says, Mary, I'll teach you what you should believe. Think yourself a baby, that you have taken these tenders for true pay, and which are not sterling. So he's lying to you. He's just trying to have fun with you. He's going to abuse you, and then he's going to leave you, is what he says. Now, if, again, to try to bring in the good father part here, if he is really afraid uh, for her reputation, which may be true, and of course is underlying this, is his concern. The way he reveals it here is not merely concern for himself, it's concern for his own reputation. And I've mentioned that already, the reputation is important. He's a narcissist, and his ego is what's most important in the entire world, even if it means that your, your son and your daughter have to pay for it. Look at this. You don't understand yourself so clearly as it suits my daughter. A daughter of mine behaving like this? Do you see? That's the ego of the parent, do you see? Tend to yourself more carefully. Treat yourself more dearly. Be careful. Think more carefully, more dearly. Or, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, roaming at thus, you'll tender me a fool. So here he's being very long-winded. This is this long-windedness of his, uh, which, which goes back to his need for uh, admiration, um, you know, to, uh, to, to look how clever I am that, that I can use these puns on the word tender. Tend to yourself more dearly or you will tender me a fool. Well, me? Me? Me a fool? What's, why, why are you even involved in this? If you're really, really concerned about your daughter's uh, future, then why, are, why is it all about you? Why are you worried about your own reputation, about being seen a fool in court? Remember, it's all about the opinion of the king and the queen and the other courtiers, do you see? And my family has to live up to my standards and not humiliate me. So Polonius is the parental, tarant, uh, uh, the parental tyrant. He demands complete control of his daughter who struggles to stand up for herself. She's no Juliet. Uh, his language is harsh, as we've just seen, and dictatorial, and it reveals he is more concerned with his own reputation than for Ophelia's well-being and happiness. I think that's probably true, although that's not absent. It's there. It's there as, what, 20% of the situation, and the other 80% is his own, his own reputation. Three times in this, this area here, three times Ophelia insists that their love is real, not likely the result of a scandal. Polonius is dismissive and mocking, infantilizing her, and undermining her confidence and autonomy. That's what's brutal. Uh, um, parents can go too far and say, oh, you're a lovely little six-year-old. You can do whatever you want. You're so smart, blah, blah, blah. And parents can ruin, idiot parents can ruin kids like that. But they can also ruin kids by being too dictatorial and not giving them enough autonomy to work through uh, their own problems. Uh, so yes, familial love is often knotted up with self-interest and narcissism. Look at your own lives. You, if you have kids, you've got to be aware of this. It's, it's a tricky trap not to fall into. Um, and uh, and look at your look at your look at the people around you. So here, uh, in terms of his um, his narcissism, we see he's very very patronizing to other people. He absolutely puts himself well well above his adult daughter, who should now be approaching something like uh, a, a, an equal relationship, because that's what you want when your kids grow up and they're actually adults. They can become buddies. If you've done it well, you can become buddies. There's always a little bit of this, but you can become really really close. But no, he wants this forever. 
He wants to infantilize her forever. So he's belittling, he's patronizing, there's a need for admiration, he's terrified of being seen as a fool in the court, so there's a narcissistic need for a admiration, and of course that narcissistic uh, uh, demands this expectation. Of course, I have the correct attitude, I have the correct uh, solution to all problems, so of course you should do what I say you should do. So there's the first really big damning piece of evidence, uh, but there is more. As we have seen, Polonius' power plays are much more open and direct when he deals with his daughter because there's no need for the indirections that he has to use with his, his more independent son. Uh, she's confined to a life. She is a girl confined to a life at court, so she has to obey her father. Um, and a good father will make it a... a, 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 a a relationship of equals whereby the girl can choose her husband, for example, uh, but not so the tyrant father. Uh, so he, he, here's, here's some more evidence. We're continuing that speech where he's telling her what to do. And here's a screenshot for, from the end of that speech where she's just she's completely cowed by her father. She has no of none of Juliet's spirit, do you see? Uh, and and, and the, the word that he uses here is slander. And I want to pay attention to this because it does go back, connect back to what we said about um, uh, the reputation. So he says towards the end, he says, this is for all. Puts his foot down, tyrannical father. I would not in plain terms from this time forth have you so slander any moment leisure. Don't waste, that means, that's a double meaning, two meanings. Don't waste any time uh, as to give words or talk to your Lord Hamlet. Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways, I shall obey my Lord. And there's that very, very weak submission uh, Ophelia is certainly no Juliet. So dictatorial here. But I want to pay attention to slander because that's important. So slander here means abuse, to abuse one's time, to waste one's time. But it also echoes other uses in the play. The word slander appears, I think, two other times. Uh, and But the idea of slander appears several times in the play. And so again, if you connect, if you put that web together, you see that that becomes one of the themes of the play, is that, that uh, the, the need for reputation. Uh, slander, of course, means to destroy reputation. And if you're a courtier, oh my goodness, if you're a courtier, what's your job? Your number one job is to maintain your reputation because as soon as that's gone, you're out of the court, do you see? And so someone like Polonius, a, a, one of the highest ranking courtiers, he's the advisor to the king, his reputation is everything. And so he's concerned about that. So that emphasizes Polonius, uh, uh, Polonius the courtier's chief concern is himself, do you see? So even Juliet's dad pretended to give her some autonomy. If you remember Romeo and Juliet, the father said when he was talking to the suitor in Paris, he said, well, she's getting old now and the new modern dad kind of thing is to let her choose for herself but then he completely uh, abandons that philosophy later on in the play okay but at least he pretended to give her some autonomy uh, so here again in terms of his narcissism we see his ad has his need for admiration his need for uh, to protect his reputation that's the desire for uh, for everyone's praise he's demanding look 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 to it, I charge you. There's no, no, of course my ideas are the best ideas. Just shut up and do them. And there's no empathy here. So that's uh, a narcissist too. Uh, uh, lacks empathy because the empathy is uh, deserve. He, he himself or she herself is the one who deserves the empathy, not other people. And so he has, he has no, he's not pausing and saying, wait a minute, does she really love him? And as he says, oh, as he has says, uh, says elsewhere in the play, maybe Hamlet really does love her and he's not fooling around. So uh, that's, again, an open question. All right, most damning of all is when he reads the letters to the entire court, I believe. Polonius's public humiliation of of his daughter, I think, is 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 the, his worst uh, one of his worst behaviors in in the in the play. He publicly humiliates Ophelia in front of Claudius and Gertrude and the court by reading aloud Hamlet's love letters. Oh my goodness! Just imagine your parents read your intimate private conversations with your boyfriend aloud to everybody. And to boot, he does this in a way that boastfully demonstrates his con the control he has over her, his possession. So not he doesn't just say, oh, yeah, so here's, here are the letters. We have to look at them because it's a bad situation. We're trying to help Hamlet. I regret. No, he does this in a way. Look what she's done because I told her to. Listen, listen to this in Act 2, Scene 2. This letter, he announces, in obedience hath my daughter shown me, and more above hath his solicitings, as they fell out by time, by means, by place, all given to mine ear. Listen to the language there. Look at that. That's, that's not someone dealing with the personal problems of his daughter in a loving, caring, empathetic way. That's the, that's the voice of a master courtier trumpeting for the king 
how well he did his spying job. Knowledge here is power, and I got it all. As they fell out, by time, by means, and place, she told me everything. I did my job, king. So there's his desire for the admiration of the public, of, of the king. He's been very boastful here. I'm in control. He's been very demanding. He obviously commanded that Ophelia do what he says, and belittling above all belittling. Um, there's in the text, there's no clear evidence of whether or not Ophelia is supposed to be on stage at this particular time, because uh, the stage direction is not there and she doesn't have any lines. Uh, but I think it was brilliant to actually put her on stage and have her look like this. And the king and the queen are standing over here and she's just, just here's the letters and she has nothing to say, no voice whatsoever. Uh, even worse, perhaps, the goodwill that we feel towards Polonius for his humble and sincere, uh, sincere apology to Ophelia evaporates. Remember we talked earlier in this video about how, yeah, he's kind of a good father because he does humbly admit his mistakes and there seems to be real empathy there for, for, for Ophelia and Hamlet's situation. But all of that goodwill evaporates when he explains to the king that his decision to keep Ophelia and Hamlet apart was not, in fact, a mistake like he had said before. I made a mistake. Oops, dear Juliet, I'm sorry. But when he's in front of the king and Queen? No, none of that. He says, it wasn't a mistake. I did what I had to do as a father because he has to maintain his reputation. I'm going to show you the quote in just a second. Uh, so it wasn't a mistake, he says to the king and the queen, but it was a fatherly duty to protect a wayward daughter. Yes, my daughter was having trouble. And so I was hot on the, when I saw love hot on the wing, I went straight to work and I did my job, right? Like I'm supposed to as a, as a good father, right? So essentially he sacrifices Ophelia to save face with the king and the queen. Remember, he thinks that he's to blame for the insanity of the king and queen's son. He's to blame. So he's got to deflect that blame in, by any means possible. And he throws his daughter under the bus in order to do that. He skillfully deflects and preempts the blame for causing Hamlet's madness by framing his decision to keep them apart as something that every good father would be expected to do. So how could you expect me to do any less? You'd do the same, wouldn't you, king, is what he says. He uses the salesman trick of trapping the victim in agreement first, making it hard for them to back out of that forced agreement. Now, that's what a good salesperson, a good, bad salesperson will do is they'll trap you. Wouldn't a, 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 a vacuum cleaner salesman came to our house one time and said, what would you do? Don't you want to keep your family healthy? Uh, well, there's all, did you know that there are all these micro uh, bugs and stuff in carpets? So don't you want the best... Don't you want to keep your family healthy by having the best, most powerful vacuum cleaner? And I said, yes. And then he says, well, see, now I'm in the agreement with him and it makes it hard for me to back out. And that's exactly what Polonius does here. It's really, really clever on Shakespeare's part. God, he was such a smart psychologist. So he says here in this particular scene, he says, but what might you think when I had seen this hot love on the wing as I perceived it? I must tell you that before my daughter told me, look at the boastfulness here. Look at this. I saw that they were hot, that love was hot on the wing between them, even before she told me I'm a good spy master, aren't I? Do you see? What might you think or my dear Ma or our dear majesty, the queen think if I had played the desk or table book and given my heart a winking mute and dumb and looked upon this love with idle sight. So what would you think if I did nothing? If I did nothing about this hot love on the wing, what would you think of me? So see, he's trying to draw them in and agree. Well, actually, yeah, yeah, you're right. You should, the father has to make sure that has to protect the daughter. Yeah, you're right. The father has to protect the daughter. Yeah, you're right. The father has to protect the daughter. He's, he's, he's baiting them with that. He's, he's trapping them with that forced agreement. What might you think, he says, for the third time? No, I went round to work like a good spy master, and my young mistress, thus I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince out of thy star. This, this must not be. That's a lie. It's a straight up lie. What he said to Ophelia earlier was that Hamlet is, is corrupt. Hamlet is a cad. Hamlet is trying to use you. He's not a nice guy is what she said. he said to Ophelia. And in front of the king, he says, he doesn't say any of that. He says, Hamlet's a really good guy, he's implying, but he's a prince out of thy star. He's too far above you politically, so you'll never be able to marry him is what he said. It's an absolute lie. I never said that your son was dishonorable. All I said was that he was too far up the political ladder for, for Ophelia to have any hopes, so you shouldn't have any hope. Do you see how, oh, do you see how nasty that is? It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. That's the kind of guy that Polonius is. And the narciss narcissistically speaking, there's the boastfulness we already saw. I saw it before she even told me. I'm smarter than everybody. Uh, the need for admiration. Again, he's throwing his daughter under the bus to salvage his own reputation, which is in a bad situation here. If you 
sorry, King, I made your son go insane. Sorry, please don't cut my head off. Do you see he's trying to protect himself from that? He's very demanding, of course. So I went round to work and just told her what to do. He's exploiting Ophelia. She's explo he's exploiting her weakness in this situation for his own preservation, self-preservation. And of course, he's absolutely belittling her by having the whole court read these love letters. Uh, another thing to add here, we could say his stammering, disjointed speech really suggests the fact that he's panicking here. He's fear he knows that he's guilty. He knows or at least believes that he's, he's the cause of Hamlet's insanity. And so he, that, that disjointed speech, he's rambling, uh, uh, suggests that he, 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 he is protesting too much. The gentleman doth protest too much. Uh, maybe he is actually guilty of causing some trouble. So again, I, I want to draw attention to this lovely, lovely but oft neglected phrase. There's tricks in the world. And it's from here. There's tricks in the world just before she goes and saying, this is part of the tricks in the world. It's part of the tricks in the world that she's not emotionally uh, and mature, she's not mature enough to handle, I suppose. Emotionally, she's incapable of handling it. And that, I think, is at least 50% of the reason why she goes insane. There's lots of evidence in the play of Polonius's hypocrisy. As I've said, probably almost every speech that he has, he's been hypocritical in some way. But uh, it's most obvious in his advice to Laertes. We can see there are four. I got the four pieces of advice that he gives to Laertes, which is lovely advice, but he doesn't, he doesn't follow any of it. So as we have seen, evidence of Polonius's hypocrisy abounds. Most obviously, he's guilty of violating many of the wise precepts that he lays out for Laertes as rules for proper behavior. So here's the first one. So here's uh, Act 1, Scene 3, where he's giving the goodbye advice to his son. He says, give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Great advice. Don't, uh, don't give thy thoughts no tongue. Don't, don't just blab out the first thing that comes to your mind. Be wise and think about things. And don't act in any way that is not very carefully thought out, DC. Great advice. I try to follow that myself. But of course, Polonius gives everyone all of his rambling thoughts all the time. He never follows that advice. He talks and talks and talks and talks and he won't shut up. And his action to bar Hamlet from Ophelia was certainly not the result of proportioned thought. It was the result of unproportioned thought. He didn't pull back and think, okay, what's going on here? Maybe they do love each other. Maybe he is sincere, blah, blah. No, it was just a, a, a reaction. You guys love each other. You say you love each other. I don't trust anybody. It's just, just this knee-jerk reaction. Uh, so here's some evidence against uh, uh, Polonius's um, uh, uh, to prove that Polonius is, is a hypocrite and that he doesn't follow his own advice. Gertrude says in one of the scenes, he says, Gertrude rolls her eyes. She can't stand Polonius, I don't think. And in, in the 2009 version, uh, Penny Downey uh, portrays Gertrude as just has no patience for this buffoon. Uh, Claudius is more sympathetic uh, to, to, to Polonius. But she's sitting here. She wants information about her son. What's going on with my son? I'm worried about my son. And he's going on and on and on, blathering on and on, giving uh, his tongue, as uh, giving his thoughts as much tongue as possible. And she says, more matter and less art, she says, with a, with, uh, with a, a roll of the eyes. And Polonius says, says, Madam, I swear I use no art at all. Ha, ha, ha. There's the hypocrisy again. He, 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 he does nothing but blather and blather and blather. He's incapable of, uh, of using less art. So here again, we see his boastfulness and we see his overestimating of his abilities to control his tongue. Uh, in a similar vein, he gives this advice, which is actually quite similar advice. Advice number two, he says, give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Listen to everybody, he adds to it. Don't, don't speak, don't be the one that says, you know, I believe this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true, and not listen to the guy, you know, just shut up for a little bit and, and take everyone's opinions. Polonius, however, he prefers to give his voice rather than his ear, obviously, as we've just seen. He continually interrupts the player's recitation with his commentary and judgment. So here's another good example. This is when the players come in and the players are reciting uh, the scene that uh, Hamlet asked them to recite. And it's quite beautiful and engaging and Hamlet is, in, is, in, uh, is, is, is enthralled by the performance. But Polonius can't resist letting somebody else talk. That's what a narcissist does. They can't resist. There's this over sense, the sense of self-importance. Why is everybody else talking? It's supposed to be me who's talking because I'm the important one, you see. I'm the smart one. And he overestimates his ability to judge good acting here. So he says, this is just a, this is all broken up, okay? Uh, but these, these are his interruptions as the players are doing their job and reciting a play. Uh, before God, my Lord, well spoken, well spoken, with good accent and with good discretion, he feels the need to comment. This is too long, he feels the need to comment. Good, good, mobled, um, mo mobled queen is good, he feels the need to in insert. Look where he has not turned his color and has tears in his eyes. 
Why does he have to draw attention to that? Everybody can see that the actor has brought tears to his eyes. Prithee no more, he says towards the end. So again, he can't shut up. He has to give everyone uh, 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 his voice. He gives very few people his ear. Uh, advice number three, take each man's opinion, take each man's cen censure, but reserve thy judgment. Again, it's similar to this. It's like, listen to what other people have to say. You might learn something, son. Shut up and listen to what people say. You might learn something, but don't necessarily judge them, okay? Uh, rather than listen to others' opinions, of course, as we've just seen, Polonius seems to feel his judgments are always welcome and always correct, as in we've just seen with number two here. And when he insists that he's right regarding Hamlet's madness, even though, th even though his theory is going off the rails about the madness and the love affair, DC, he still insists that this is the case. So he says here towards the end of, of uh, his trying to convince the king and the queen uh, of what's going on between Hamlet and uh, and his insanity. Uh, Polonius said, Hath there been such a time, I'd fain know that, that I have positively said tis so when it proved otherwise. Of course, even though things are looking shady, trust me, trust me, stick close to what I have to say. I have never said anything that's wrong. And again, here's his overestimating his opinions. As we've seen at the beginning of this video, he, uh, he, he trusts himself too much. That sounds pretty opinionated to me. It sounds like he's not reserving his judgment. He's saying, I have the judgment. Everybody should shut up and listen to me. And I shan't to listen to anybody else. Uh, the fourth fourth piece of uh, Laertes' advice that he gives uh, to say goodbye to his son is this, and it's lovely. We've already looked at this briefly, but it, it's a lovely line, and I wish it were true. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Lovely, lovely phrase. Does he really want his kids to be true to themselves? Is that what the tyrant parent wants for their children, you be you, you be you. No, you are me, is what the tyrant parent says. Emphatically, Polonius wants Laertes and Ophelia to be true to his own self, his dictates, his needs, not their own. Hence the spying and control. Go back and look at bad father. Also, Polonius is false to everyone else besides Laertes. He spies on Laertes, he spies on Hamlet, and, the, and to the king and the queen, he lies to them and says, Lord Prince, remember when he said, Lord Prince is a star, is a prince out of thy star. Remember, he says to them that uh, he told Ophelia that, that not that Hamlet is a jerk and wants to uh, uh, ruin your reputation, but that Hamlet is simply politically out of your sphere. Uh, so, so don't even think about it. That's a lie. So he lies to everybody. Uh, he's untrue to everybody. He lies. He is false to everybody. So does that mean he's being true to himself as a spymaster liar? Maybe we could think of it in that way. But yeah, so this, this becomes absolutely meaningless. He ruins it. He ruins it by his own behavior. So these falsehoods and deceptives render the advice in number four absolutely meaningless, tragically meaningless, because we want to believe them. Uh, so here's some more evidence to support his hypocrisy here. Uh, Polonius says, uh, Hamlet will come straight. Look you, look you lay home to him. Tell him his pranks have been too broad to bear with and that your grace has, hath screened and stood between much heat and him. I'll silence me even here. Pray be round with him. And Gertrude says, I'll warrant you fear me not. So this is the scene. This is the terrible closet scene where they're setting things up. This is the, the lovely Penny Downey here. Just absolutely no patience for this buffoon who's coming to ruin her, her night even more. Uh, so here he is being the, uh, the absolute, uh, he, he's a spy uh, for the king, spying on Hamlet, but also spying on Gertrude too, to make sure that, uh, that Hamlet and Gertrude aren't counter uh, spying uh, to take down Claudius DC. So here's his self-importance and he's very, very demanding. He's, he's actually telling, He's telling the mother how to behave with the son, do you see? Be round with him, pray you, be round with him, she, he says, trying to control everything. So there's another example of Claudius, just before the closet scene, not being true, not allowing anybody to be true to anybody's self through the, through the dishonesty, through the spying, and through the bullying, trying to tell the mother how to behave with the father. So there are all of the pieces of advice that he gives, or most of the four of them anyway, uh, pieces of advice that he gives to Laertes, all shot to pieces by his own hypocrisy. Okay, so this is really interesting. Polonius the spy master. When we read Polonius uh, today, we see him merely as this meddling, irritating, annoying, uh, a buffoonish kind of uh, uh, a meddler. Uh, Shakespeare's audience would have seen him in a different light, though. Polonius can be read allegorically as representing 
someone from real life, do you see, representing a historical, a historical events. Plumes can be read allegorically as one of the high-ranking spy masters of the Elizabethan court, like William Cecil. So you're probably familiar with Queen Elizabeth I, but her advisor was a guy named William Cecil, and apparently he was a pretty brutal anti-Catholic uh, a rabbit attack dog, more or less. Uh, in Elizabethan England, uh, they were persecuting the Catholics. Elizabethan England was essentially a police state. It really, really was. Uh, Queen Elizabeth is considered a, quite a good ruler in many respects, but in one respect, not so much. She she was the the she presided over a, a, a brutal police state. Uh, the country was recently made Protestant, and so the country prosecuted the Catholics who were forced to go into hiding. And if you if you if you take a trip a tour throughout England and go to some of the uh, the old houses, uh, the manor houses and stuff that were owned by Catholics, you'll see they had these little private chambers where they tried to hide themselves so they wouldn't be persecuted by the uh, the witch hunts, spying in witch hunts to root out the Papists, the people who believe these evil people who believe in the Pope still, because we are now independent of the Catholic Church, we're independent of the of, of the Pope, do you see? So the spine and the witch hunts to root out the papists were commonplace. And if you watch this video, this here's a link here to this video. This is where I got some of this information. There's a, about five minutes where he talks about a, a brief a brief history of this stuff. But you don't, you don't need to go into a lot of depth. You can, but you can as soon as you as soon as you're aware of this possibility, you see that yeah, that is probably Polonius. Uh, a, com a comedic version of what Shakespeare's audience would have recognized as this kind of uh, a top advisor. So the tense atmosphere of fear and paranoia created by the Machiavellian deceptions of Polonius and everyone else in the play, as we've seen, would have resonated with Shakespeare's audience in a way very, very different uh, than, than we see it today. So once you see him as Polonius, if you read a little bit about his history, you'll see that, yeah, Polonius, these kinds of figures were not necessarily kind of just goofy, dumb dads, do you see? Um, okay, and to prove that, we can talk about poor Ophelia's madness. Ophelia's madness is at least partly caused by the, her unfitness for the intrigues of the times. If those were the times, if the whole country was paranoid and you had friends, neighbors across the street, Shakespeare's own family, the father was suspected of being Catholic, and Shakespeare, that would have been very, very much uh, in, in Shakespeare's mind when he was writing a character like, uh, like Polonius because his father was in danger and he was in danger himself as, as, uh, of being taken in and hauled before the court and maybe, maybe tortured for being a closet Catholic, D.C. So it was, it was very, very real. And if you are involved in this, you have to have a per could you be a spy? Could you be a spy? Could you be a, 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 a refugee? Could you be? Could you go through these traumas? The whole country is after you, and you're hiding in, in a basement. You know, you're hiding your crucifix in a basement. It, it takes a tough personality to handle that kind of stuff. And some people are not so tough, male and female. And here's a, a female version who can't handle the tricks in the world, I, I strongly, strongly believe. Her father was at the center of these intrigues. Her father was at the center of this world of underhanded real politique. He was. He was the he was the, the William Cecil. He was the advisor to the king, and he was in charge of all this stuff. So she would have gotten wind of all of this stuff. She would have sensed it. She wouldn't have known really what's going on, but she would have known there was stuff going on, and she's not cut out for this, do you see? Well, most of us would not be. It takes, it takes a real strong character uh, to, 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 to look at this stuff up close and, and still handle it emotionally. Uh, so here, here's a lovely, I love this. This is a gentleman. This is towards the end. This is actually the scene here where a gentleman comes in and says, you know what, ha Gertrude, uh, uh, poor Ophelia is having a really, really hard time. And worse than that, uh, she's starting to spread rumors. And so we got to take care of this stuff. So the gentleman comes in and she says, uh, Ophelia speaks much of her father. So there's one cause for her insanity is her father. And she says she hears there's tricks in the world. She hems and beats her heart. She spurns enviously at straws, speaks things in doubt that carry but half sense. So she's talking nonsense, but they've got some sense in them, do you see? And she's, she's, she's going on and on about these tricks in the world. That tells me that she's having a hard time dealing with, uh, uh, as I said, dealing with the political machinations in her own family and in, and in life, uh, in the court and in the country generally. So her speech is nothing, and yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. So there's something in the nothing, do you see, that is dangerous. And Horatio pipes up, and in some of the versions, it's not quite sure whether or not Horatio should say this line or, or Gertrude herself. But here's where, she, here's where she says it, actually. In the 2009 version, she actually says this line. 
She says, or Horatio says, it were good that we, that we have to speak with Ophelia, for she may strew dangerous conjectures into ill-breeding minds. She's behaving like this kind of spy master as well. She understands the importance of reputation for her own family, and she's not immune to the tricks in the world. She participates in it as well. And again, it's pervasive. It's a wasteland. Go back and watch my wasteland video. The whole place is a wasteland. And if you got to deal with the wasteland, you better be a tough cookie, a tough psychopath like Claudius who can handle it. Gertrude, not so much the psycho, not, not, not a psychopath, and she doesn't handle it as well as Claudius does. But she handles it better than, than Ophelia does. And then Gertrude participates. She says, let her come in. Even Gertrude and good Horatio participate in the real politique. I'm, I'm going to do a Horatio video too. And he's not quite as, he's, he's set up as a really good Benvolio kind of character, the good guy. Uh, but he's, th there's a little bit to say about him too. He's not quite as perfect as Hamlet would like him to think. Okay, so a few more pieces of evidence. And then we'll move on. Polonius actually says, I'm a great spy master. He says, I am the best William Cecil that has ever lived. He, he, he is the king's eyes and ears, and he takes excessive pride in doing his job well. So here he is boasting. Here's his narcissism. He's boastful. He's overestimating his capabilities. He's, he's demanding. He's, he has a strong need for the admiration of the king. He says here, he says, if circumstances lead me, sir, I will find where truth is hid, even though it were hid in the very center. Even if it was buried in the center of something, I will find out the truth. Well, there's, an, a, there's a, 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 a professional spy. Those are the kind of spies you want working for you if you indeed have spies working for you. Kind of like the CIA today in the American context, perhaps. So the real politic deceptions were reserved for the king and the queen and his spy master. Uh, here we see, too, as they're getting set up uh, to spy on Hamlet in this particular scene here. Here he is, the spy master, watching uh, the interaction between the two lovers, intruding on their interaction. Uh, here's where he's setting it up. And the, the language here reveals that, yeah, this is just a common place. It's a common legal procedure whereby we are supposed to be spying on the Catholics because we have to get rid of them because they're a threat to the state, the Protestant state, do you see? So Claudius says uh, to, to Gertrude, as, they're, as, these, as Claudius and Polonius are getting ready to hide uh, to watch their to watch their uh, interaction. He says to Gertrude, he says, "Sweet Gertrude, leave us too. Please leave. She's not part of it. She's not in the political realm, do you see? So she doesn't have access to these political uh, machinations. For we have closely sent for Hamlet hither. He's going to come and confront Ophelia, that he, as twere by accident, may hear affront Ophelia. Her father and myself, lawful espials." will bestow ourselves that un, that seen, unseen, we may there encounter frankly judge. And Gertrude said, yeah, sure, okay, I'll obey you. So there's an acknowledged, justified, and legal assumption that, yeah, spying is just part of what we do here, do you see? And I really like the ec extra metrical insertion. It adds the weight. We've seen this before uh, in Shakespeare. He wrote in iambic pentameter, remember, that he, as twere, by accident may may hear, that he as tour by accident may hear. Five IMs in a line, that was the usual. There's tons of variation, but this is huge variation. Affront Ophelia, her father and myself, lawful espials, lawful espials, lawful espials. He comes down heavy, not with an IM, he comes down heavy on the first syllable instead of the second syllable, and that creates this weight to the situation. So yeah, there's more evidence that I'm, I'm trying to prove that he can be read as this allegorical spy master figure. Uh, it is. It's part of the tricks in the world, do you see? Uh, uh, knowledge is power, and power is my game, says the spy master. That's what it's all about. So again, narcissism, willing to, uh, willing to exploit anybody for their own gain, do you see? For their own uh, 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 glory. Uh, and, of course, the Machiavellian uh, deception is rife. It goes all throughout, uh, all throughout England. He's a dedicated Catholic hunter. Do you see? I will find out circumstances even if they're... I will find out the truth even if it's hid in the middle. Do you see? Uh, and, of course, he's defensive here because he screwed up regarding uh, uh, Ophelia and Hamlet's relationship and Hamlet's insanity. You are aware already, even if you're not aware, of uh, a good writer's use of parallel characters. In Shakespeare, he did it a lot. Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are the same character, uh, male and female version, uh, as, as I briefly mentioned. Uh, you're, you're aware of this from your own 
popular fiction. Great writers do this. Ron and, and Harry are parallel characters. They live parallel lives. They have very similar situations. They're both young students. They're both boys. Uh, but by contrasting them and, ha and, and showing how their lives are unfolding, the writer can reveal certain characteristics of both of them, uh, primarily with the focus on the protagonist, of course. Uh, this, these two screenshots capture it best. This is what a great writer can do. We've got the conservative, strict matron on the one hand and the, the flaky hippie type on the other hand and look at the visuals here the hair pulled up tight suggesting order 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 and control and the hair all you know frowsy and flying all over the place can uh, uh, representing a total lack of control a total lack of order and chaos perhaps the googly eyes wide open to absorb any information <laughs> that the person gets and this person with the small glasses only willing to accept uh, what what she will accept the conservative and the liberal perhaps in par in, in 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 grotesque extremes but it's so so effective and a good writer will also humanize both characters she's humanized she's so flaky I wouldn't want her as a teacher by any means but when she's on she's on she's got something in her that is useful to humanity she's not a waste of humanity and she's not a total witch either uh, she, she's really, really strict, but at certain points in the in the stories, J.K. Rowling will reveal her humanity and her empathy. So that's what great that's what great use of parallel characters can can do. It's fantastic, and Shakespeare was brilliant at it. I would say in all of his plays, prove me wrong, but I would say in all of his plays, Shakespeare uses mirrors, doubles, parallel characters, foils. They're called character foils, antagonists even. Harry Potter and Voldemort, they're parallel, and they reveal something about each other. Brother and sister figures, these are sister figures, these are brother figures. To draw attention, he uses them to draw attention to traits of certain characters by contrasting differences and comparing similarities. That's what great story writing, storytelling does. Now, I'm going to briefly outline uh, what Polonius and Hamlet have in common, and then I will uh, pull out some quotes to analyze very quickly. Okay, so... There are both, you should know, annoying know-it-alls. Polonius teaches everyone what's right and how to behave, of course. He's wagging a finger at everybody, and he, uh, uh, most hilariously, he teaches the spy how to spy. Uh, Hamlet, too, is an annoying know-it-all. He unforgivingly demands correct behavior by everybody, everybody, his mother especially, and, and, and Ophelia, too. He teaches hilariously the actors how to act, and I'm going to show you that quote today. Uh, now, I don't want to get too detailed into the, to the technical definitions of overt and covert narcissism, but I think generally we can, we can think of Polonius as an overt narcissist, and, I, and, and my understanding, it's a loose understanding, is that he, 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 he's, not com he's not compensating for anything. He's not compensating, compensating for low self-worth. He's actually, he does believe he's great. He does believe he's great. Compared to, compared to Hamlet, whose narcissism is very, very evident, but it comes from a place of self-worth. And so he's compensating for that low self-worth by bolstering himself up and making him look good in front of everybody. They are both hypocrites. Uh, as we've seen already, Apollonius does not practice at all what he preaches. Hamlet too is a, is a hypocrite in that he demands perfection from everybody. But he himself is far from being perfect. And I like to, I always try to draw attention to uh, Holden Caulfield, the character in Catcher in the Rye. Holden Caulfield and Hamlet are basically the same character. I do strongly recommend you, watch, you read Catcher in the Rye. It's a brilliant story. Uh, and he, yeah, Holden Caulfield expects everybody to behave in a certain way. The whole world is corrupt because they don't, they don't behave the way Holden Caulfield expects them to behave. But Holden Caulfield is guilty of all of the sins that he accuses other people of, of being guilty of. Uh, they are both arrogant, domineering, and cruel. And for Polonius, that's especially true in his behavior towards Laertes and Ophelia, as we've seen. And Hamlet is arrogant, domineering, and, and cruel uh, regarding his mom, Ophelia. And Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and Osric, uh, he's really cruel to those guys as well. That comes from their narcissism, I think. They're both deceptive, cunning, scheming, and Machiavellian, as we've seen, and, and so is Hamlet. Uh, they are both comic relief. Now, th look at this scene. This is a brilliant scene. Again, uh, David Tennant is the best Hamlet I've seen so far. Uh, there's different ways you can play Hamlet. You can play him more aggressively and more masculine, uh, like the Kenneth Branagh version, uh, 1996. Uh, or you can play him uh, in a more comedic role, a more feminine role, I think, because uh, he, he, he's a much more wounded person uh, than uh, Mel Gibson, for example. Uh, or Kenneth Branagh. 
But anyway, it's hilarious. The, the banter between these two, again, this actor and this actor, they, they do that, 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 that comedy really, really, really well. Uh, there's, uh, in, for Polonius, he's foolish, of course. He's becoming senile. He's the foil. He's the clown for Hamlet's barbs and wit. It's like a Marx Brothers sketch. Uh, it really, really is high comedy. And on Hamlet's part, uh, he provides comic relief by, by using his antic disposition to allow him for this kind of Marx Brothers. Go back and watch the Marx Brothers movies. They're fantastic. Uh, uh, absurdism, uh, the nonsense, non sequiturs, which means phrases that don't follow from another phrase. They're just a, a complete nonsense. Puns and, and hilarious chaos. And this is from one of the scenes. It's, it's, it's really, really, really funny. Uh, again, go back and watch my Hamlet video and you get more details on all of these things. But let's compare how they are similar. This is my favorite one. Uh, it's absolutely hilarious. The annoying know-it-all, both of them. Neither Polonius nor Hamlet can resist the opportunity to tell someone their own business. Look at these screenshots. Here's Polonius telling, teaching a spy how to spy, and here's Hamlet teaching an actor how to act. It's, they're the same. They're the same. It's, it's, oh, it's such great storytelling. So here's, here's Polonius talking to uh, Ronaldo. He says, so by my former lecture and advice, shall you dig up gossip on my son? You have me, have you not? Basically, are you paying attention, spy, as I tell you how to spy? Do you see he's saying, he's saying that, and he, Hamlet says the same thing over here. Are you paying attention, actor, as I teach you how to act? Here's Hamlet talking to the actors. He says, speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of our players do, I had as leaf the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, but use all gently. <laughs> he's telling an actor his own business. Absolutely hilarious. And these screenshots... Uh, capture it perfectly. Uh, the narcissist, we've already looked at uh, Polonius's narcissism in these little black boxes throughout the video, so go back and look at those. I'm not going to repeat them, of course, uh, but here's some evidence that of, of Hamlet's uh, narcissism. Again, if you want more of it, go back and look at my Hamlet video. So here's Hamlet uh, right when he sees Laertes jump into Ophelia's grave, uh, expressing tremendous grief, uh, dis distraught grief over the death of his sister. Hamlet's narcissism kicks into overgear and says, somebody else is getting more attention than me? I can't let that stand. And so he, he, he bursts from the bushes with Horatio and says, what is he whose grief bears such an emphasis? Who is this guy who's so distraught at, at, at someone's death? Whose phrase of sorrow conjures the wandering stars and makes them stand like wander-wounded hearers? This is I, Hamlet the Dane, the king of Denmark is what the implication is. Who dares upstage me. So here's Hamlet, the narcissistic drama queen. Histrionic personality disorder is part of that as well. Do look at my video. Uh, here again at the very, very end, this is a very tender scene. And, and I'm, not, I'm not belittling Hamlet here. This is over. This is crazy. He needs, he needs help. He needs therapy here. Here, maybe not so much, but there is evidence that he is, uh, that, that he is narcissistic. And even in his death, it's lovely, lovely words. He says, you, all you people around me watching me die that look pale and tremble at this chance, all of these mishaps that are but mutes or audience to m the act of my death. He literally sees himself as the leading man on a stage. It's Hamlet. It's self-referential. The, the, the character of Hamlet seeing himself as an actor on the stage, do you see? Really, really interesting storytelling. All of you people watching me die here, you are mutes, and mutes means characters that just come out on stage and they stand there like guards or something, and then they don't say anything. You were all mutes in my tragedy. You are all audience members in my life. Do you see how narcissistic that is? Very narcissistic. If I had the time, oh, I could tell you, but let it be Horatio, oh, but let it be Horatio, I am dead. Oh, I could tell you my story, I could tell you my story. Everyone here who's gathered to watch me die. Very, very narcissistic. Literally, he sees himself as the leading man. So there's, uh, we've seen uh, Polonius's narcissism throughout the, the play, and now we see some evidence of Hamlet. Go look at my Hamlet video if you need more information. Hypocrites, uh, we've looked at Polonius as a hypocrite, so go look at him in, in number four in this video. Uh, and here are some examples from Hamlet. Again, watch the video. So the naive schoolboy Hamlet begins the play by railing against hypocrisy and inauthent inauthenticity at the court. And a very, very famous line, one of the first things he says in the whole play is that I am not a hypocrite. All you people, all you other people are hypocrites. I, the adolescent fool, am no hypocrite. Seems, madam, Gertrude says to him, does, why, why, does, why does, if death is natural, death of fathers is natural, why does it seem so unnatural to you? And Hamlet says, seems, madam, nay, it is. I know not seems. Listen to that. Listen to that adolescent overconfidence, DC. There's, there's, but the hypocrisy comes in later. 
after encountering the brutal realities of life outside the university, so he's not sheltered in the university anymore, he's in the real world of real politique, the tricks in the world, and he has to deal with it, he's not cut out for it either, similar, in a similar way that Ophelia is not. When he encounters this real world, he, quick, he becomes a quick study in the Machiavellian art of deception and manipulation and hypocrisy. So that's if you want to live in the real world, in a world of tricks, in a world of these deceptions, you have to learn to become a Machiavellian yourself. So here, here is the screenshot from when he's actually uh, uh, saying this. When he realizes he hears the news from the ghost, the ghost tells him what Pl Claudius actually did. And he's actually kind of, David Tennant captures it perfectly. It's the director and David Tennant would have, would have communicated on how to portray this. And they decided to have him actually... There's shock at how evil people can be, but there's also a kind of admiration for how perfect the villain Claudius is. He says there, oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. My tables, that's my notebook, schoolboy notebook. Do you see how naive he is at schoolboy language? In my tables, it is suitable that I set down in my notebook that one should smile, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. Oh, so this is how the world works. I get it. Wow, do you see? There's shock and admiration here. He's a reluctant student of the Machiavelli. He said here that I'm not going to play that game. I'm superior to that game. And now he says here, I'm going to play that game. Is he a hypocrite or is he just growing up? Good question, ladies and gentlemen. So here he is again, uh, deciding to live in this world of hypocrisy, live in this world of deceptions and tricks. He says to, uh, he says to, uh, to, to Horatio and the other and the other characters, he says. Uh, please don't reveal my plot. Please don't reveal my Machiavellian deceptions, but here they are, as I perchance thereafter shall think it suitable to put an, an, an antic disposition on. So I am now going to become a liar to the whole court by pretending to be insane. So again, is he a hypocrite or is he simply growing up? Is he fighting fire with fire or is he being corrupt by the system? So there's a question for you. All right, let's look at their arrogance and cruel domineering attitudes. Polonius and Hamlet are both arrogant, domineering, and they can be very, very cruel. For Polonius, of course, in this video, we've already looked at it. Let's go see f number two, bad father. And here are some examples of Hamlet's cruelty as well and, and arrogance and domineering attitude. So Hamlet, of course, very, very famously, he's, he yells at Ophelia before he yells at his mother here. He yells at Ophelia. He says, get thee to a nunnery. Go. You are scum. Like men are scum. Women are scum. Everybody's scum. You are scum. So get thee to a nunnery. Farewell. Or if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. So all women are corrupt. All women make cockholds. All women are unfaithful. All women make cockholds of their husbands. So get you to a nunnery and lock yourself away because you're not worthy of, of, of marriage, do you see? So that's, that, that's, that's an arrogance. He claims to know what all men and women are like, really. And there's terrible cruelty here because Ophelia does not deserve this at all. Uh, in, a, in a similar way, here he is yelling at his mother, claiming to know everything about her, everything about how she should behave. And Gertrude says she pleads with him three times. She pleads with him in this play in a similar way. He says, she says, oh, Hamlet, thou hast cleft my heart in twain. And Hamlet says, knowing how everyone should behave, he says, throw away the worser part of your heart and live the pure with the other half of your heart. Good night. Do not go to my uncle's bed. Assume a virtue if you have it not. Ouch. That's really, really cruel. Even if you are a slut, basically, is what he says. Pretend that you aren't, do you see? So again, there's that arrogance. He knows what's best for everybody. He's domineering, and he's very, very cruel. Mr. Bossy Pants, and he actually says, I must be cruel only to be kind. So uh, we've seen it in Polonius, and there it is in Hamlet. Uh, they are also both, in a similar way, they are also both deceptive, cunning, scheming, Machiavellian. For Polonius, of course, see all of the above. We've already seen that in this in this video. And here are some examples of Hamlet's cunning. And see also, uh, uh, the hypo more, more specifically, see the hip hypocrite part for, for Hamlet as well. And again, always go back and watch my Hamlet video. There's tons of stuff there. So with the establishment of Hamlet's antic disposition and the mousetrap scene, the play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. That's straight up Machiavellianism. That's straight up. That's right out. The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king is straight out of Polonius's spy master, William Cecil, witch hunting for the Catholics playbook, do you see? I'm going to catch someone with this mousetrap. So Hamlet is all in on the deception, the cunning, the scheming, and the Machiavellianism. 
After he establishes the antique deposition, the whole plot revolves around the battle of cunning, the scheming between the two Machiavels. Machiavels were stock characters, the evil guys, uh, Hamlet and Claudius. That's that's now it's a and now it's actually now we could talk about Claudius and uh, and Hamlet being parallel characters too, which is true too. Okay, so here it is. I'll have grounds. So the the ghost has told me what Claudius did, but I can't trust him. I have to get proof. So he says, I'll have grounds more dependable. I'll have reasons to commit murder to kill Claudius more uh, uh, solid than this. Uh, the play is the thing where I'm going to catch the conscience of the king. So he announces the scheming in very, very grand fashion with the final couplet, which rings at the end of a speech and draws attention to itself, uh, uh, increasing its importance. Uh, and here's here's evidence, of course, for his scheming in terms of the mousetrap play. Remember the play? He sets up a play, and he's going to watch he's going to watch Claudius's response to an enactment of the same murder that Claudius performed, uh, and thereby decide whether or not Claudius's uh, reaction proves that uh, he's guilty or not. So Claudius says, "What do you call this play?" And then Hamlet says, "Straight up, mousetrap." I'm a Machiavelli too, by the way, he says. I'm a spy master too, by the way. I can play this game too, by the way. It's called the Mousetrap. Tis a knavish piece of work, but what? Oh, what What of that? Your majesty and we that have free souls, it touches us not. It's not very subtle spying, actually. He says, you know, go ahead, just watch it freely. It's not going to bother you at all because you, you've, you've got a, a, you don't have a guilty conscience, do you, king? Is what what he says in a, in a in a sarcastic way. So he's, I don't I don't think he's very good at this kind of spying. I think he would make a bad spy master. He's a smart guy, but I think he would make a bad spy master. Okay, we're going to end with a really really funny one. Comic relief. Let me let me explain this. We are all familiar with the comedy duo, the pairing of opposites. Here's Pinky and the Brain. If you've ever watched, if you've never watched that, go watch a few clips if they are on YouTube. I'm not quite sure, but those those are hilarious. A pairing of this really smart fool with this really dumb fool. Do you see? This is from the Marx Brothers. Uh, Marx Brothers is brilliant. Go watch Duck Soup and Animal Crackers. It's abs they're absolute masterpieces of absurdism, uh, nonsense, non sequiturs. Means uh, does not follow phrases that don't follow one another for 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 comedic effect. Tons of puns and chaos. Uh, this is Groucho Marx and Chico Marx. They play the character of Polonius and and Hamlet. It's the same. It's the same thing. As parallel characters, Polonius and Hamlet are part of the comedy duo tradition. The smart fool plays off the dumb fool for laughs. He's the foolish fool, and he's the clever fool. Now, he's a clever fool because he's, he's pretending to be a fool. He's pretending to be insane, right? But he's very, very sharp, uh, and that, that makes the whole situation really, really funny. So Hamlet's antic disposition allows Shakespeare to write some hilarious, absurdist banter, employing nonsense, non sequiturs, and Ham Shakespeare's favorite pun. Shakespeare loves puns. And in writing the character of Hamlet, Hamlet can be classified almost as a comedy, do you see, except that everybody dies at the end. But when it's funny, it's really, really funny. In the same way that that quote unquote low humor is funny as well. And this ain't low humor, by the way. These two these are, these are actually masterpieces of their own genres. Um, so the comedy duo relies on the pairing of opposites, as I've said, and traits the traits of each other highlight uh, each other by contrast, do you see? And similarities. Maybe all the humor comes in that they're so similar. Because the, hu the, 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 the humor here comes into he thinks he's so smart, but he's being so stupid all the time that the similarities, the crossover, is what makes it interesting. The crossover of the pairing of opposite is what makes it funny. He, he too, he's smarter than this guy, but he's really dumb as well. And so that crossover makes it really, really funny. And similarly, Hamlet's foolishness is what makes uh, it funny uh, uh, in comparison to, uh, to, to Claudius's real, real foolishness. So the audience identifies, of course, we always identify with the smart good guys, right? So we always identify with the smart fools, we identify with Hamlet, uh, as Hamlet mocks or is frustrated in a funny way by the dumb fool, which is Polonius, of course, none of us watch Hamlet and see ourselves as Polonius, none of us. We all see ourselves as the put upon, the put upon Hamlet. He is the put upon uh, uh, half of the duo by the foolishness of this guy. He is the put upon fool, uh, smart fool, that who is put upon by the dumb fool, you see. We always see ourselves as those guys, which is funny. It says something about human nature. So here we see it. Uh, here we see it, and this is from A Night at the Opera. It's not my favorite one, but it's actually quite good. So here's these two guys talking in this particular scene here. So Driftwood said, uh, they're trying to read it, they're trying to make a contract, a legal contract, and Driftwood. Uh, 
uh, is, is Groucho Marx. And he says, all right, I'll read the contract to you. Since, since the f dumb fool can't read, I'll read it to you, says the smart fool. But does he look very smart here? No, he doesn't. It's really, really funny. So he says, all right, I'll read it to you. Can you hear? If you can't read, can you hear? And uh, 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 Chico says, I haven't heard anything yet. You say anything? Well, I haven't said anything worth hearing. Oh, that's why I didn't hear anything. Well, that's why I didn't say anything. So do you hear the nonsense? If you go back and watch my existentialism video, uh, uh, existentialist uh, deals a lot with the absurd. And this was a masterpiece. All of the philosophers, the early 20th century philosophers loved the Marx Brothers, by the way, because they were great examples of, uh, of that absurdity, the total loss of meaning uh, when you use non sequiturs and random puns, do you see? And here is a brilliant, this, this is right out of the Marx Brothers by by Shakespeare. This is this scene here, okay? Polonius comes in and he's looking down at uh, at David Tennant and David Tennant is on the floor pretending to be insane, reading the or pretending to be reading a book. And Polonius says, "So, what do you read, my lord?" And he replies absurdly, "Words, words, words." Do you see the absurdity of it? It's hilarious. "What is the matter, my lord?" So, what is the what is the content of what you read, my lord? And then he takes it as a pun, because the matter can mean two things. It could mean the content, or it could mean what's the problem with somebody. What's the matter between who? I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Do you see this guy getting frustrated? Slander, sir, for the satirical rogue here says that old men have gray beards. Of course, he says in the book it says that old men have gray beards. And of course, there's more nonsense there because old men do have gray beards. So how could it be slander, do you see? So Shakespearean absurdism, brilliant, really, really funny. It's nonsense, non sequiturs, puns, and chaos. So really, really good stuff. Here's another example of Shakespeare's comedic pairing of opposites. Uh, Hamlet says to Polonius, he says, go take care of the players, uh, see that they're well bestowed in a place to sleep and give them some food. And Polonius says, so my lord, I will use them according to their dessert. Now, as soon as somebody says this, uh, uh, Hamlet says something, Shakespeare has an opportunity to riff off of it, to make something funny from it, turn it into a pun, and that's exactly what happens here. Hamlet says, God's bodkin men, treat them much better. If we use every man after his dessert, if we use every man according to what they deserve, we will all be whipped. Who will escape whipping, do you see? So again, there's the, there's the, 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 the opportunity at every moment to display Shakespeare's wit and for Shakespeare to, to display Hamlet's wit. Now, even more egregious... Uh, example of, of pandering for jokes, I guess you could call it, uh, shamelessly pandering for jokes is this. This is brilliant. Shakespeare shamelessly sets up an opportunity for puns and an insider visual gag. Uh, Shakespeare's, watch this. Shakespeare's actors who were on the stage in Shakespeare's time, the guy who was playing Hamlet and the guy that was playing Polonius, they had previously played Caesar and Brutus in Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar. So the audience would have recognized them as Caesar and Brutus. So do you see the opportunity? Shakespeare sees an opportunity now uh, to, to make a joke. So Hamlet says, uh, uh, so, so Hamlet, right before the dumb show, when they're talking about uh, acting and stuff like that, or, or the, the subject of acting is in the air because there's a play about to be performed. Hamlet approaches Polonius and he says, my lord, you played once in the university, didn't you? And Polonius says, yes, that I did, my lord. I was accounted a good actor. Of course, there's his narcissism. Of course, I'm a good actor. I could put a black box there, I suppose. And Hamlet says, what did you enact? It's all a setup. This is all a setup. I did enact Julius Caesar, says Polonius. I was killed in the capital. Brutus killed me. So there's the setup. And Hamlet comes in with the joke that the audience would recognize. It was a brute part of him to kill so capital a calf there. Loaded with puns here, but the visual gag, so there's the puns I'll talk about in just a second, but the visual gag is really, really interesting. Uh, uh, they would, again, they would have recognized, the audience would have recognized that, yeah, Brutus and, uh, and Caesar are on stage again in the form of Hamlet and, uh, and, and, uh, and Polonius. So it was a brutal, there's the pun on the word Brutus and brutal. It was a brute part of him to kill so capital, capital is not just the capital of Rome, the capital city, but capital can also mean the top of something. You were such a, you were the top, you were the paragon, you were a great calf. And there's a, the, the images of a sacrificial, a, sa a sacrifice of, a, of an animal in the capital of Rome is what they used to do back in those days. And people would have known that they made animal sacrifices. But calf can, calf can also mean a dumb person meaning there's an insult, there's a backhanded insult to Polonius. So this is a loaded, loaded line 
And part here too could mean the part of a play, and the part means uh, the the role that the that the that the murderer played. So again, uh, I don't think Hamlet would never ask Polonius a normal small talk question like that. Do you think Hamlet had zero time for Polonius? He didn't want to meet him. As soon as Polonius walked in the room, he was like, oh, God, get me away from this guy. So why would he actively go up and out of interest? Was he really interested? Oh, oh, interesting. You, you were an actor too? That's cool. Hamlet would never do that. But Shakespeare has him do, do that, I think, because he wants to riff off of this, uh, the, the insider joke. The audience knew that they were looking at Caesar and Brutus as well as Polonius and Hamlet. I think that's absolutely brilliant. So there we go. Those are the... The comic relief, the pinky in the brain, the Groucho and the Chico of Shakespeare's era. They are parallel characters. Very, very interesting. Okay, so that was Hamlet character analysis Polonius. I hope you found that useful. And if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget to pick up a copy of the PDFs if you need them. See the description for details. Thanks for watching.